Welcome back, Alejandro. Thank you for doing your investment analysis overview of Estee Lauder, a pretty famous makeup company that I know about, like a lot of women have used their products. So feel free to take it away. Hello, Michelle. Hello, everybody. As always, it's a pleasure. This one, uh, obviously, is not my, I, I don't use their products, but um, is it was very fun to do the investigation and learn. I mean, as, as we always say, the more you you study companies, the more you learn, the more you can connect the dots and the better you can invest. So let's start with this. So I, I start again with the stock and, and the reason is because um, at the end of 2022, uh, at the end of 2021, as we can see, it touched a price of $365 and now it's at a 97, as we can see. So obviously that brings interest, especially for a company that has so much presence in so many places and is so well known. I mean, at least in the, I mean, in the uh, girls in industry. So definitely, I mean, it caught my interest and as I've been doing lately, just I find the book and start reading it and just start learning about it. Definitely a very, very great exercise. So what they do, that Stella there is a leading manufacturer, a maker cutter of uh, hair care, makeup, fragrance and hair care product. It's a luxury and prestige brand. They are present in 150 countries. They sell their products through different channels like the pharma stores in prestigious locations, duty free. They also sell their products online and others. And they have around uh, 1,900 stores, 1,600 with only one brand and 300 with multi brands. And uh, first thing I underline duty free is because this um, is a place where they've been struggling lately. Uh, I mean, with after the COVID, I mean, a lot of people less traveling. So they did have a big advantage on these duty-free places because it's very, very difficult to, when you are established brand, to get into these places. I mean, not, I mean, you, I I don't know if, if you had experience, but you always see the same store and, and they do very well. These locations are very expensive, but I mean, they, they sell so much in these places because you don't pay taxes uh, that you can, you find these great products at, a lower price. So I mean, people when they're traveling, they I think they are in the mood of spending, and when they're in the mood of spending, obviously they spend more and a cheaper price. I mean, it's a great, great place to be. But as we're gonna see later on, um, in China, I mean, the traveling is slowed down so much, and a lot of these um, places have been affected because of this, and this is one of the big reasons. Estelle Lauder has gone down so much, but um, as we said, I mean, the important thing is to study, try to understand and try to look into the to the future to see if it could be a, a good investment. If you understand the company and as we always say, understanding is being able to predict with a degree of accuracy, how is this going to look in five, 10 years, 20 years, obviously by what Mr. Buffett has taught us. So the moat, uh, I mean, obviously they have a big brand, but as we're going to see in the couple of next slides, I mean, they, their, their, his, their brand is not only Estelle other, but they have La Mer, they have Clinique, they have Mac. Um, skincare is the most product segment and they have great relationship with dermatology that recommend their products. And to me, this is a very important thing because I think building relationship with doctors and dermatologists takes time. I mean, you have to to really invest in doing conference talks, and uh, when many times they just like one one brand and they are just going to keep recommending. And when you trust your doctor, I mean, you you're not going to mess up with this. I mean, if I guess if if you Michelle go to a doctor and she tells you, oh, okay, for your type of skin, you should use let's say La Mer. I mean, you are not going to be just playing around with this because it's your skin. And for most people, I mean, the skin is very, very important. So the products tend to be very sticky. People do not, as I said, change their skincare or uh, fragrances very often. 
So this is a, a big mode uh, that I feel is important to, to see for Stella out there. So here's some of the most important acquisitions. This, um, as we're going to see, is, is an industry where there's been a lot of acquisitions, and um, especially by the two biggest guys, which are um, Estelle Lauder and uh, L'Oreal in the prestige industry. So Mac, probably one of the most well-known, Tom Ford, D. Yard, or some of, of them. Um, for example, Mac was, I mean, it was acquired a long time ago, but it was around like 200 million. But Tom Ford was first acquired a little piece, but at the end of the tire exercise, when they completed this acquisition, was uh, it cost around $2.3 billion, which, I mean, is, is pretty pretty big. Um, yeah, pretty big amount of money. So here are the brands, and uh, they it's very interesting because they are, Premium, but they also like to to play in every aspect. So, uh, Leonard, the son, I mean, he he really wanted to do multi brand to be able to to attack every segment because um, he was very impacted one time that he was talking to someone and uh, this person said that uh, Stella Other is a great brand, but it's used by my grandma. So this impacted him very much because he saw that in the future, I mean, obviously not a girl that is 30 years old, usually is not going to want to use the same um, skin product that their grandmother. I mean, not it's not always the case, but, you know, the tendencies and the new things and uh, social media and new, new era makes it uh, a changing um changing products so i mean obviously you you do want to be updated trying to innovate and um as as i said before i mean a lot of this company has been built by still other but others been bought um as we're going to see later on but in the goodwill um it's not that that, that much so they've they been able to to acquire them at pretty uh, fair prices so uh, here's the competitors, which obviously very, very interesting. L'Oreal, which is the biggest in the in the industry, but Unilever, Procter & Gamble. Some of them are just like competitors in the beauty industry, but are not obviously directly. But I mean, the, the biggest, biggest competitor of them, and we're going to see a little comparison later on, is, is L'Oreal. But LBMH, which is, uh, you know, the owner of Louis Vuitton and so many great brands and um Bernard Arnault was named the uh, richest person in the world. I think the last year. I don't. I don't think he is right now. I think most Musk is at the moment, or I'm not hundred percent sure. But obviously, this guy is in everything. I mean, they own Dior, Sephora, and many great brands. So definitely a very um, compete market. I mean, uh, look, Lancome. Uh, Prada, I mean, Diesel, Valentino, just brands that I think come to mind for most people, even to me that I'm not like that uh, involved with these prestige beauty brands. But in the other side, there's also celebrity competitors, which with the big hype of social media, I mean, they just take uh, so much market and I don't know, like the new new generation likes to to buy and try new things. So, I mean, pretty pretty well-known people, right? R R R Rihanna, Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, Kylie Jenner, Hailey Bieber, Kim Kardashian, Priyanka Chopra, Jessica Alba. I mean, the, she's not that big, but she's my favorite actress, so I had to put her. <laughs> so spending by age, I, I, I have put a lot of graph because this really helps you understand how, how this evolves and um, Alice helps definitely me because as we can see, like most of, of the people are between 25 and 44 years. If if you add us almost 40% of the market and the other 60 divided in the rest. And obviously one of the reasons because at this age is when you're in the workforce and you, you want to look good and 
Uh, I mean, doesn't mean in the other edges you don't want to look good or anything, but it's just probably not as important as a requirement. Um, spending beauty brands by country, again, more numbers, but definitely I think it's very important. And United States, I mean, as always the biggest one, but when you add Japan, China, South Korea, uh, that, that passes almost the... Yeah, that's almost 100 billion. So if you add these three markets, uh, that is more important than the United States, which is very, very hard to find companies where America is not, is not by far the most important market. It is by, by just by country, but by um, geography, which we're going to see later divided, is, is not. So this, this makes it, I think harder to understand because it's like more locations to to see what's the tendency. And as we talked before, I mean, with um, Ch mainland China just losing so much travelers, this uh, make makes a um, still other. I mean, in risk of becoming an an old brand, or to say it some way. So social media here, this one is, is pretty, pretty interesting because I mean, as I said, L'Oreal is the, is the biggest one. And uh, from these brands, um, only one is uh, owned by Stella Lauder. So this is not very well. Maybelline, for example, is also owned by L'Oreal. Guerlain is owned by uh, LBMH. I, I apologize, Maybelline is owned by LBMH. Nivea and the other ones are probably other categories they don't I don't feel they compete directly because I think they're cheaper products but still I mean only having one in the top 10 in, in social media I think is is a little worrisome for such a big brand with such such tradition so uh, L'Oreal has been doing a great job even here and skin, skincare by region which is the most important um market for um, Stella other and, and as I said before, it's Asia Pacific. North America is very important, but when you add everything, Asia becomes more important. So again, very, very important to to be able to see where, where is the puck going because that's where you need to to make your investigation. And um, obviously it's great to talk to people to to understand what's make you um, buy these type of brands because for example one one thing in the prestigious thing is like for example when you buy a bmw or a mercedes or let's say a ferrari and um, you buy and you know it's luxury but at the same time i mean you are looking for social proof you are looking for somebody to to see and be like oh you're cool or something like that the problem with skincare and uh, makeup is uh when you put it on i mean maybe your skin looks great but people are not i mean they don't they don't know that you use, let's say, La Mer, which is probably one of the most famous brands in skincare. But let's say if you find a, a, I was talking to someone and she told me that in Korea, she she's finding great products. And as I said, I mean, she's paying, I don't know, one third of what La Mer costs. And if it's making the same impact on your face, I mean, you, you're you not going, I mean, you might change it. So definitely, um, since there's no social proof, I think that's that's a risk because, as I said, uh, yeah, the the little package is beautiful and it's cool and um, it makes you feel cool. But if people don't know that you are using it, I mean, I don't know. Do do you care? Like for example, when you 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 use a luxury brand, I mean, let's not say this, but I mean, I don't know if you have a well, like, like let's say for some eyeshadow, there's like a product that like other people I know have used, like some friends and family. And that one seemed to be a really good one. So it's more like word of mouth. Like even if you you don't know who made the eyeshadow at first glance, looking at someone's eyes, but when you tell them, oh, it's from this one. And then it makes your friend want to buy that because they, they said it looked good on you. So that's only when you find out by word of mouth. Yeah, absolutely. That That, that is a great point. The most valuable brand, L'Oreal, still out there. And this is in cosmetics, just by like the brand as a, a whole. 
This is not like the whole company, just by as a brand. And Clinique is here too, so which Clinique is owned by by still other. So the income as we can see in 2022, they sold 17.7 billion and now they are at 15 billion. So obviously this is worrisome. I mean, one of the reasons the stock has gone down, but as I said, I mean, it was in 360 and now it's at 97. Um, obviously the, the net income is going down pretty, pretty bad too. The things like they've been doing a lot of investments in uh, improving the supply chain, just in, I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of companies have been doing a lot of investments in how they manage their uh, supply chain and their um, inventories because with technology, I mean, it, it has become way more efficient and, you know, uh, where a product is selling and by uh, these um, accounting uh, programs making it easier and more efficient to use, I mean, I mean, everybody has everybody that has the capacity have has to to invest in this because they are get, definitely given a a big advantage if they don't. And they in their conference calls have talked that they spend a lot of money in this. But I mean, when you're spending and doing capital investments and the, the sales are not going up and or at least maintaining, I mean, obviously it's worrisome for investors. The balance sheet here. Um, Account receivable plus inventory that analysts always like to see. Um, account receivable plus accounts payable uh, is a little, it's like 300 million over in accounts uh, received. I, I, I apologize. Account receivable plus inventory is about 3.8 billion and accounts payable is 1.4 billion. So there's like a plus of 2.4 billion that is in inventory. So different from other companies that we have seen before. Um, Stella there has to have working capital for the inventory different from other companies that uh, are just being basically financed by their suppliers. And that goodwill, as, as we said, I mean, that's the, the amount over the asset that is paid by the, the companies when they do acquisitions, which is not that, it's, it's pretty low compared to, for example, L'Oreal, we're gonna, we're gonna see in an graph, I did a little comparison. The cash flow uh, depreciation and amortization uh, compared to capital expenditures is about the same. So they are not really uh, opening, let's say, more little little stores or different things. I mean, like as I said before, they are just investing a little, I mean, not a little, but a good amount in technology, but they are not really growing like the pie. I mean, they're really trying to make it more efficient, trying to maybe even close some of the stores that are not performing well. A lot of the problems that they had is that, um, for example, they were present at, I don't know, dealers, uh, Macy's, so uh, that uniqueness was being lost. So people will be confused. So a lot of, they are trying to synthesize most of the company. So this is a comparison with L'Oreal, which is the, the biggest competitor, I say, and as we can see, uh, L'Oreal more than double sales. Uh, the gross profit by percentage is greater for L'Oreal, but the goodwill, uh, they they definitely have spent way more in um, buying brands, and also they have been able to buy more valuable brands, to be honest, uh, but still. Uh, property plan equipment is the same. It's, I mean, I'm sorry, it's not the same, but it's about the same. So this is not really good because the other one is selling the double with the same property plant and equipment. So obviously L'Oreal is way more profitable. Uh, inventories, I mean, yeah, they have the double, but I mean, they, they're selling the double. Uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable is way bigger for L'Oreal. But as I said, the, the, the worrisome part between these two and to me, what opens my eyes is definitely the property plant at the equipment because I mean, with the same property, so with the same amount of tangible assets, they are selling way more than the double. So that's definitely not good for still other. Uh, here's the sales by region. In Europe, they double 
uh, in America, they triple them. And in Asia, they just double them. But again, L'Oreal is, is beating them. That doesn't mean it's a better investment because what's important, I mean, one thing is what they sell. One thing is the profitability. But the most important thing, as Mr. Buffett always says, is the price we pay for it. So that's what we have to look, being able to value both. But obviously, L'Oreal is a company that you have to have in your mind. I, I went to Instagram, which I think is where most brands are moving. And um, Stella, Lauder just had 4.5 4, uh, 4, 4. million. And well, L'Oreal has 11.3 million, which is a little comparable to, to the sales. So I guess it makes sense. But um, look, Stella there has more posts. So, I mean, they are more active, but I guess they are not getting the same amount of a response pretty pretty interesting things to, to watch because social media these days is very very important especially for this type of companies uh this is how the sales have been have in the last eight years and as i said for example look at 2023 they declined by 19 percent after a a upward in Europe, which it is the most important market uh, by total sales. So obviously this, this make it worse. And here is how e-commerce is growing um, in the beauty products. So e-commerce, I think is very connected to social media. And as we can see here, um, from 2022 to 2027, it's projected to grow at 12%. And uh, well, travel retail is projected to grow at 10. And Stellar was very, very strong here, but as Asia is just, um, as I'm sorry, as uh, mainland China is slowing down, is is making it difficult for, for this company to, to keep doing good. Uh, sales by product. Here I, we can see a skincare is the most important one. More than half of the sales. Makeup is the second one. Fragrances. In fragrances, it uh, happens something particular compared to makeup and skincare from what I can see. And most of the time, I mean, when, I don't know, you use a perfume or something, people that know that product um, know what brand it is. So that that is different from makeup and skincare in my concept. So, but at, at the same time, I mean, it's just, uh, one sixth of the sales. Uh, total asset by region, as we can see, I mean, in America is where they have most of their assets, and which means is where they have invested the most. And I want to go back a little to show that. No. Uh, whoa, sorry. I don't. Oh no, here, here. I apologize. Um, no, I, I. I think I didn't put that graph. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the assets in the Americas they are they are not as profitable as in Europe, for example, and they have three times more assets. So um, definitely they either have to keep investing more in Europe and a Asia, or they have to do something because when you have the most investment in a country that is not generating the net profit, I mean something is going wrong. So Definitely a lot of a lot of red flags for 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 Stella there, but again, definitely worth studying. Uh, here's the debt, uh, as I always like to point out. I mean, it's just I mean the numbers are not that high, and it's pretty well spread. So I mean, I do I think they do have a, a good structure, but again, I mean, if they are not generating good numbers, I mean. You can have the best structure and, and are not going to be able to to pay it, and you're going to have to refinance at higher interest, which is obviously not good. And I mean, the lessons that run from the book: uh, every woman can be beautiful, which was the lemma of Miss Stella there when she started. I mean, she was very, very into going to every opening, every new store, and I, I think, as Buffett always says, I mean, um, you can 
it's hard to compete with fanatics and she was definitely a fanatic. I mean, she would just go every day. She would work from start to finish. I mean, there is a myth that she, she will never go to launch, but everybody, I mean, at the beginning, she would stay in the store and just sell through through the day. And, you know, this this hunger for, for doing that right thing was was a big part of what made her grow to the top. Start positioning your brand at the top, and uh, this is very interesting. And I heard this from other big entrepreneurs before because, uh, let's say, if you start at Walmart, you're not gonna go from Walmart to Sephora, but you can, you can start in Sephora and then just keep, keep opening the space. So basically, start the most prestigious thing and then start going down, which is what they don't. At the same time, um, it can be a risk because you you might lose that uniqueness when you are paying, especially more than other competing products. Uh, keep this as we employees, but be respectful. I mean, this was one of the things that uh, Leonard Loder said. Uh, I don't know if it's the right or not, but it came to me very interesting. And what basically what he said is like, obviously you have to be very kind with your employees. You have to, to be open, but uh, you kind of go get drunk with them because when you go get drunk as a leader, I mean, how are you going to tell them to behave or to do something in the in the future? Keep pushing with retail shops at the beginning. As I said, I mean, there is also the myth that she she will, for example, she will get an appointment at Saks or something in New York and she will get there at seven and she will wait even 12 hours if it was necessary until that seller will come out and talk to her so that that grid always is is very known in in the big big um, entrepreneurs that have been able to succeed become uh, friends with other store departments they will recommend your product and this was another thing i found very interesting because miss tell other she will go and become friends i mean again this is at the start but uh, she will become friends of, I don't know, people from other parts of the retail mall. So obviously she will be like, and when they ask, oh, where's the skincare? That, that person will recommend, let's say, I don't know, you go um, and, and become friends with the, I don't know, in a department store with the person that sells, I don't know, tires or whatever. And just become friends with them. I mean, she will go become friends with them and then when, I don't know, a customer will come away and ask, where is the skincare that will recommend her? So I thought it was pretty interesting. Qualis, quality is always top of mind, especially with prestigious products. Multi-brands, good or bad idea? Uh, I, I put a question mark because, you know, as Mr. Buffalo always says, I mean, it's not that easy to make something work. So if you start playing with other brands and uh, trying to, to create new brands is, is not always that easy. What, what, what do you think about that, Michelle? I wanted to, to point yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes a lot of them can get lost in the mix because consumers might have too much choice. So if if you have a lot of similar types of products and consumers can't differentiate, like they might um, they might have less less of a decision. So they they won't buy it if they if they have too many choices. So sometimes multiple brands might not always help. Like sometimes if people understand the value proposition of each, it could work, but yeah, it could also get confusing for consumers. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this this is something to be careful with. And, and, not all, and, and also not everything always works, you know, because there is, I don't know, Dr. Pepper, I think, um, works in Texas, but in California, it doesn't work. So why this happens, uh, it's just, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. But... Right, yeah, or yeah, different segments respond differently to different brands, right? Mm -hmm. Costco samples, uh, it comes from the book that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it's called um, Influence by Rory Saldini, and it's reciprocation, and basically, uh, Miss Lauder will always use these tricks. So basically she will uh, put makeup on a woman's face and this will make them connect. And 
obviously, if she looks beautiful, she's going to buy the product. So, I mean, this was a very big, big uh, trick that, I mean, every every company use. But I wanted to mention because she does talk a lot about this in the book. And I mean, we know Costco does it. And I, I always think uh, every time I go to Costco, I think of how Charlie will be telling them to to do this stuff because I, it's funny because um, uh, Charlie gave a a Bercher Hathaway stock to Cialdini and I mean, not a B share, he gave him a, an A share and it's because he loved his book so much. And yeah, I always think that Costco is trying to do all that that book says because I mean, you know, we know how much he, he loved that company and that he was part of the board. So this is that company I keep my life in beauty. And this was a uh, wrote by the son of Mr. Lauder. Um, and definitely a great read. As I said, I mean, you, you learn a lot by reading the book, the culture and definitely worth a read. So, yep, this is what I had for you, Michelle. Well, thank you so much, Alejandro. It was great learning about Estee Lauder and it's interesting to see how they're somewhat underperforming lately, and maybe it could be related to the overall economic cycle of people are are feeling some of the inflation, um, money crunch, and maybe they're not spending on as many discretionary items like beauty products and skincare. You know, you you could skip out on some of that if if you're just willing to use plain bar soap, and you know you might not be able to afford nicer skincare if you might not have the money for it. So I wonder if that's happening to Estee Lauder in the last few years of people are just not um, able to afford it as much. The consumer is 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 feeling um, some of the financial pressures in the economy. So there could be a lot of things going on uh, or, or maybe L'Oreal is just doing that much better as a competitor. There's a lot of good questions to come out of this and people who are interested in this company or other beauty and skincare companies will learn a lot from this. So thank you very much again. Yeah, absolutely. All that you, you said makes sense. And, and yeah, the important question is being able to, to answer the question and get to a conclusion. Is this permanent or is this just temporary? And that's, that's the, the important question to me to answer for Stella out there. Sounds good. Well, thank you again, Alejandro. We'll be back again next time with hopefully another one of your analyses. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Bye.